Okrima Media's Polity Amtabi um, Madiba, researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sadna joins me today to unpack his column titled The Contribution of the UDF and People's Power to Our Understanding of Freedom, Part 6. You argue that the people's power required non-sectarianism that is not requiring everyone to be UDF or ANC in order to succeed. But that did not stop people from victimizing black consciousness people. So was this a big problem and is still a problem? Well, for the UDF and people's power to succeed, you needed to involve all members of the community, not just people who were members of affiliates, not just people who supported the ANC or the SACP. So in order to undertake mediation activities, you couldn't just punish people who are black consciousness or PAC or things like that. It wouldn't work. But on the other hand, the idea of pluralism, having different ideas and different identities, is not well entrenched within the ANC-led alliance to this day, in the sense that certain ideas are frowned upon, people attacked black consciousness people, especially amongst the students, and we we in the Transvaal UDF, as it was then called, uh, had to go to certain places to explain that when we say you want to win people over to the position of the UDF, it doesn't mean using your fists. They have the right to other positions. So there's not a well-entrenched tradition It's part of this idea that the liberation movement, the ANC in the case of South Africa, CPP in the case of Ghana, represents the nation to be. And everything else is not really tolerated in the same way. And you find this to to this day, but you find it in other respects in the sense that there's not adequate uh, recognition of distinct identities. There's a reference to tribalism as ethnic chauvinism. Now, it's true that there are certain ethnic expressions that can be chauvinist, such as xenophobia. But to have pride in your language, have pride in your cultures, is something for which we have to show respect, but we have to uh, show respect in a way that engages with the customs and cultures, because not every custom is worthy of respect. In the article I mentioned, Ugutwala, where a woman can be waylaid, kidnapped, raped, and forced into a marriage. Now, that is a custom but it should be completely outlawed in South Africa under our constitutional order. So it's a very complex thing that on the one hand, you can't just label any expression of ethnic identity as ethnic chauvinism. There's a difference between bearing an identity as part of your being in a way that is not harmful to anyone else and being chauvinist. And it's not always done by the liberation movement. Also, Raymond, you argue that the UDF and people's power were obstacles to the rise of the ANC becoming leader of the nation state, and that the ANC relegated these other forces to civil society. So where does the mass democratic movement and negotiations come into this? I don't know that it was a direct conspiracy, but it's how it happened in that the state first crushed the people's power and the UDF during the 80s. And in that place where there was no uh, expression of the voice of the UDF and its affiliates, the mass democratic movement emerged to stand in for the UDF, but it didn't have those links with 
the communities didn't have an organic link with the streets and the areas and the zones. Consequently, it did displace them. When negotiations occurred, a lot of what was done was in secret. So it wasn't only uh, a secret from the UDF, it was a secret from MK, it was a secret from many of the individuals in the ANC and Communist Party. So when negotiations started, it was a small group of people, leaders, admittedly, going to negotiate the future of the country and then reporting back from time to time, A, to the rest of the leadership, but as far as possible to other sectors, provinces, regions, and so forth. But this was not possible, as I mentioned in another inter earlier interview, was not possible to involve people in the same way as people's power, because people's power was direct involvement, where if you're negotiating something about community living, then the community would be directly involved in negotiating and discussing and, and impacting on it in the future. There was no place for the street committees in the constitution. It was not possible to constitutionalize these things, but there was no attempt to find a place for the popular, as can be seen in the way in which people, who many of whom were involved in popular power, don't even mention it in this 40th anniversary. And lastly, the sectarianism, you say, was also related to anti-pluralism. And in addition to the demand to being a UDF or ANC supporter, you related to intolerance of tribal identities. So how big a factor is that? Yes, well, I've already partly dealt with this. It's something that is important to this day. You, hate, you hear people... Uh, making statements about some ethnic groups to the north that they dress garishly or this is a way, I don't want to mention the group, but it's said about uh, non-Guni uh, non people, just as people who are not uh, in Guni speak about Cosa, Cosa Nostra and things like that. So you do have these divisions amongst the African people which is part of the failure of non-sectarianism and tolerance of everyone and respect for everyone's identities to take root, to be actively um, commended as a quality for all people by the leaders. They will inherit each day, perhaps mention it, but they don't act it out on a daily basis. That is why you have a range of types of community conflicts in South Africa, which have got something to do with not building a, a nation that respects one another and all its identities. That was Professor Raymond Sutner speaking to Krimer Media's polity about the contribution of the UDF and people's power to our understanding of freedom at six.